Let's open our Bibles. To 2 Corinthians chapter 4, and you're just going to stay there. I want to just talk today about priorities in our life, personally and as a church, going forward. If we do not have the right vision, we are going to perish. If we don't have the right priorities in our lives, and I'm talking about the right priorities, we are going to be swallowed by the world in seconds. The spirit of the world is strong enough in the world, but I want to tell you, it is a, it, there's a desire of the devil to invade the, the church with that spirit. To rob you of what Jesus has for you. And to see the priorities that we have going forward to finish the race well. Do you know that we all have the capacity to finish the race unwell? Because Jesus is not going to make your decision for you, Keith. He's not going to come to, 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 to Wendy with an audible voice and tell you what to do. He's just going to present the gospel to you. And at the end of the day, you decide what you want. You decide what your priorities are. Because if your priorities are Christ-centered, there will be eternal consequences, which will be good consequences and eternal value. Everything in Christ has eternal value. Everything outside of Jesus Christ has no value. It might be of value to the world. If you've got lots of money, you've got a better job, you've got a better career, you've got a few names behind your own name that makes you feel good and you feel well in the eyes of the world. But as far as the Lord is concerned, what good is it if you gain the whole world, but you forfeit the very life of Christ? So the deception that's come into the church today is live for yourself, live for your dream. It's not living for your dream, it's living for the Lord's dream. And that's a deception today. We decide what we want and we'll look a little bit more about that. But today we need to look at what our priorities are going forward. And I don't think we're going to finish everything today, so I'm not in a hurry. But the first thing that I want you to understand, going forward, one of your priorities is to be equipped by the Lord. That's why Jesus brought 12 disciples around him. Why did he do that? Because he knew for those 12 men to be effective, they needed to be around him, to learn from him, to learn how he handled situations, to learn what gospel he preached. And it was like he chose those 12 men. The Lord chose those, those 12 men, but he invested in those men so that they could be effective in their service for him. And we see what happened in the book of Acts. We see what God did in their lives. We see the miracles that God did. But each one of us are in church today. And there needs to be a priority that we are ready to be equipped and to learn. You see, to have that heart to learn, your pride is going to have to die. Because all of us, if we're really honest with ourselves, we think we've, we know it. We think we know about motherhood and we think we know about this. We, we know how to run a business. We know how to do this. We know how to do that. But we need help. And even you are doing a good job as a mom by the grace of God. You still need help. Even you're running your business. And, you know, the business is doing well or your job is doing well or your studies are doing well. But at the end of the day, you still need the Lord to teach you, to invest in you, to equip you, to handle yourself the way the Lord wants you to handle yourself. But to be taught, again, you open the door for that. So you come to church, it's a heart to say, Lord, I, I'm grateful for what I have received from you, but today is another opportunity for me to learn. And I'm ready to learn. You know, it's amazing how we become so hardened in our heart. We've, we've heard this before. And that's another deception because you remember in one of the home groups I said to you, we're going to Mauritius. And we're going to hear the gospel of Jesus Christ. But it's not going to be another message. You're going to hear Mickey sharing the same gospel, the same message. 
It's not going to change. It's not like Mickey is going to, you know, now have another message for the church. Because the foundation of the church is built on the foundation of the gospel. That foundation of the cross, that foundation of grace. So how can we come and sit under an apostolic anointing and hear another message? Now today you might come to church and you want me to share about something else. But everything is linked to that foundation. Everything we hear is linked to that foundation. So when we were sitting under that apostolic anointing in that conference, the revelation of the cross, the revelation of grace was growing in all of our hearts. And in fact, Mickey has grown in a year. The depth of that revelation has grown in his heart. The depth of that revelation of the cross has grown in his heart. So when he transmits what God has brought in his heart to the church, we are benefiting from that. But it's not another message. It's the same gospel, the same spirit. But for us, if it's another message, then it's another message. We don't grow, we don't change, because all it is to us is another message. I've heard this before. I've heard the message of the cross before. But you know, it's amazing because Jesus said, take your cross daily. And we think, mm, we need this message every six months. And yet Jesus said, Take your cross daily. So the priority is investment. We need to put our lives in a place where we are receiving and the Lord is working in us and shaking what needs to be shaken because those gifts shake things in us. Shake the legalism in us. Shake the pride in us. Shake the independence in us. And when that investment takes place, it's painful. Paul made it clear in the Hebrews. He said, you know, no discipline <laughs> it's, it's painful. But later on, it produces a harvest of righteousness and peace for those who have been trained by it. In other words, when that death is taking place, where the gospel shows you you are proud, when the gospel shows you you're independent, when the gospel shows you you're a legalistic husband, like, it's that, like that gospel has shown me all over the years, and uh, how you, you're so legalistic, but to acknowledge that and to humble yourself, you're not just shouting glory, hallelujah. Death is painful. And it's pain in the spirit when the Lord is at work in us. But the value of that speaks loud because your life changes. And I want to read that scripture which highlights what I've just shared with you. How the gospel must live in us. It can't be a story. It can't be another conference. It can't be another meeting. It can't be, you understand what I'm saying? It must be my gospel. That's what Paul said. He said, it's my gospel. Is it your gospel? Is it my gospel? That's what the, the revelation is. But look in 2 Corinthians chapter 4. Verse 8, we are hard-pressed on every side, yet not crushed. We are perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Struck down, but not destroyed. Now, verse 10, always carrying about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus, that the life of Jesus also may be manifested in our body. Verse 11, for we who live are always delivered to death for Jesus' sake that the life of Jesus also may be manifested in our mortal flesh. So then, death is working in us, but life in you. Now, so many Christians want life, and they want to find life by going to Bible school. We're going to learn the Bible, and it's not a problem to learn the Bible. I went to Bible school to learn the Bible, and I love the Bible. I love the Word of God. But if there's no death in our life, there's no change. Paul said, I'm carrying in me the cross. That's what he's carrying. He's carrying the cross. When his pride rises up, oh Lord, forgive me. It's painful to acknowledge I'm critical. It's painful to acknowledge I'm proud. It's painful to, 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 to acknowledge the problem is not the wife or the, or the elder or the brother or the sister. The problem is me. Often the, today, the problem is always there. 
It's the boss. It's the husband. It's the brother. It's the wife. It's my son. It's my daughter. But when the gospel touches your heart and you see it's you, like I had to see many times, and you know my stories, but in that death, as painful as it was, the Lord brought change. The Bible says He gives grace to the humble, but He resists the proud. When we're too proud to admit we need help, when we're too proud to repent, when we're too proud to say, I am the problem, when we're too proud to acknowledge it's me, there's no death. And what? There's no life. And is it incredible that you can know the Bible backwards, but still be dead in the Spirit? And that's exactly what I was. In 2000, and, uh, not 2007, that was a long before that, when I was running the Bible school. And I'm very embarrassed to tell you this, but I'm going to tell you it. I ran a Bible school for three years, teaching in the Bible school, teaching the books of the Bible, line upon line, and all the rest of it. In fact, I had a nice title. I was the dean. Where that title came from, it came straight out of the world. Because, you know, the world wants to have titles, so now you must have a title in the church to make you feel big. So I was the dean of the Bible school, big man in the flesh. I taught the students with all my heart. Old Testament survey, New Testament survey, going through the book of James, all this and all that. And at the end of the year, the Bible school year, it's now a great celebration. You put on your gowns, you put on your hats, and now you're going to be, you're going to be given your nice little Bible school certificate, which is now your great accomplishment. You've got your Bible school certificate, Matt. That's all you need, boy. But you know what the problem was? All the students were dead. Dead in the spirit. Knowledge, plenty. But their lives were dead. And I want to tell you, half of them were backslidden. And who was the problem? The students? No, the problem was me. Because there was nothing in me, no revelation of the cross. I was giving information, giving information, giving information, biblical information, which was right. But there was nothing in me that was bringing life to those students because this cross was not working in me. And I know I can be a preacher in the church. And I know I can be uh, well-versed in the Bible, which I still need help in the Bible. And I still need to grow and learn. And be, uh, There's a lot I need to learn about this Bible. But I know one thing, that knowing the Bible is not going to bring any life to myself without that death taking place, because it won't bring life to me and it won't bring life to the church. So I'd rather know a limited amount of the Bible and grow in that knowledge but be carrying the cross in simplicity. Because when death takes place, Paul said, it, death in me brings what? Life to the church. So the priority, brothers and sisters, yes, we like to study the Bible. It's important. We need the Word of God. But we need a revelation that we need to be ready to die every day of our lives when we are exposed by the Holy Spirit. Because every day, I don't know about you, every day there's an exposure in your life. And there's an opportunity to run away. There's an opportunity to bury that under the carpet. And when you bury it under the carpet and you can look all pretty the next day with your husband, but you haven't solved the problem in the spirit. Your little meal together is not going to change anything. Your little vacation is not going to change anything. Because a vacation without a pure heart to one another means nothing. But we need the cross. We need to see the priority to carry that cross. And the Bible is clear. Without that cross, there's no life. Unless a kernel of wheat, John chapter 12, verse 23, falls to the ground and dies, it abides alone. But if it dies, it brings forth much fruit. So you want fruit in your marriage. You want fruit in your relationship with your brothers and sisters around you. You want fruit in your walk with the Lord. That's the vision that you need to prioritize in your life, to carry your cross, not legalistically, not inventing things, but when the Holy Spirit convicts you of your sin, be ready to take your cross, repent, humble yourself. And the good news is we move on. That's the good news about the gospel. No condemnation. Fighting at 9, repenting at 10, 
we move on. Never a record of your attitude. Never a record of the fight at 9 o'clock. Never a record of what you did or what you didn't do. When there is the blood of Jesus Christ has washed and cleansed you through repentance, there's only way you can be cleansed by the Lord is through repentance. That's when the blood of Jesus washes your heart. But when He washes your heart, oh, it's done. Your wife reminds you tomorrow, it's done. Someone reminds you of what you did two years ago. The blood of Jesus Christ has washed you. It's done. Never one record. It doesn't matter what mistakes you've made, how you've blown it, how you've messed up. When there's a repentance in your heart, Jesus Christ loves that. He'll never despise you. He'll never hold the past against you. Because when you are clear with the Lord and there's true repentance, the blood of Jesus Christ washes you and you are declared the righteousness of God in Jesus Christ. Do you know what that means? When you are declared righteous, what that means is that you are living without sin. You might have been sinning at nine, but at 10 o'clock, your repentance has opened the door for you to be declared the righteousness of God in Jesus Christ. In other words, you're blameless. And that's what Jesus did on the cross. We're not talking about perfection. We're talking about repentance. Bringing that righteousness every minute, every hour of my life because He's done it all. If it wasn't for that revelation in my heart, I would be finished today. I wouldn't even be standing behind the pulpit sharing the gospel because I'm weak and I failed like you have been weak and how you failed. But the blood of Jesus Christ and that identification to the cross that brings us to humble ourselves to the Lord. Oh, thank you, Lord. I can start again. Isn't that beautiful? How much condemnation has gripped people in the church today where they just feel disqualified. Who has disqualified you? Read Romans chapter 8. Jesus did not disqualify you. He did not condemn you. In fact, He opened a door for you to be righteous with Him every day of your life. And that's why we see that scripture says, Seek first the kingdom of God and what? And His righteousness. And it's something that I endeavor to do every day of my life as a priority to keep my heart pure. Because when your heart is impure, danger. Let me say that again. When your heart is impure, danger. To the pure, all things are pure. To the impure heart, the Bible says in the book of Titus, it's like you become corrupted. You can't see in the spirit. Your attitude towards people is corrupted. It's, it's not pure anymore because your heart is not pure. But when there's repentance and your heart is clean and washed by the blood of Jesus Christ, ah, I can see purely again. I see my wife the way I should see her. I see the church, my brothers, sisters, my own children the way I should see them because my heart is clear. So it's a priority for the gospel to live in all of our lives every single day. We can say amen to that. So it's not a story, it's not a teaching but it's a lifestyle, big difference. And that's what I believe the Lord is urging us as a church, to see a priority for the gospel to be some, something that we live as a revelation in our heart, and it will grow and grow and grow, and we will see the change that God will bring by His grace. Amen? The other area, and perhaps the last area that we'll look at today, and then we'll continue um, next week, I want to just uh, refer to a scripture in 2 Corinthians chapter 2. And we'll read from verse 2 Corinthians chapter 1, sorry. 2 Corinthians chapter 1 and we'll read from verse 15. And in this confidence, I intended to come to you before, that you might have a second benefit, to pass by way of you to Macedonia, to come again from Macedonia to you, and be held by you on my way to Judea. Can you see that by Paul coming to the church, it was of benefit to the church, and Paul knew that. 
but he knew that was not him. He knew that he was an apostle. And he mentioned in the Bible, he mentions, I, Paul, an apostle. But he knew that that apostolic anointing had nothing to do with him. It was simply the call. It was simply the anointing. And he knew that when he visited the church in Macedonia, what was on his life would benefit the church. That should tell us how important it is for the five gifts to be in the church. Because the Lord knows and knew what the Macedonian church needed, and they needed that apostolic gift, and the Lord was going to make a way for that. But Paul was very bold about that. But this is what I want to refer to in verse 17. Therefore, when I was planning this, did I do it lightly? Or the things I plan, do I plan according to the flesh? That with me there should be yes, yes, and no, no. But as God is faithful, our word to you was not yes and no. And I want to refer to that verse 17. Therefore, when I was planning this, did I do it lightly? Or the things I planned, do I plan according to the flesh? That with me there should be yes, yes, and no, no. In other words, when you plan according to the flesh, it's yes today, no tomorrow. But when you are led by the Spirit, there's no yes and no. It's just yes. It's clear. And Galatians says, those who are led by the Spirit are no longer under the law. That scripture, I think I wrote it down here. It's in Galatians chapter 5, verse 18. In other words, when you are led by the Spirit, you are not being driven by your flesh. You are not being driven by people. You are not being driven by any man. You are being led by the Holy Spirit to do what the Lord is asking you to do and to go where the Lord is asking you to go. But you are going in freedom. And you haven't planned that in the flesh. Because we haven't taken that decision lightly. And that's the challenge and a priority for all of us in this room today. Every decision that we need to make, we cannot take lightly. We can be so light. I'll change jobs. I'll go to another state. I'll go there. I'll do this. I'll marry whoever I want to marry. I'll do that and do this and... That is light planning. And that's why it's yes, yes, and no, no. And the only planning that bears fruit is when my plans are on the altar. And my plans are, Lord, not my will, not what I want. This is what I want. I would love that job. I would love to marry that person. I would love to take that direction. I would love to leave the church. I would love to do all these things. But Lord, I cannot take that decision lightly. I need to put that decision on the altar and say, Lord, not my will, but your will be done. Teach me your way. And when you submit your life on that altar and your heart is not your will, but the Lord's will, the Holy Spirit, I guarantee you, will teach you His way. But again, you open the door. See, today, light plans, cheap plans. We just do and go and be. But when we see the spirit of the gospel, and that is a priority for every life here today, because you can be running a good race, and overnight you're running another race. Because your flesh will always fight what the spirit wants. Did you know that? Look in Galatians. It says that there's a war going on every day in all of our lives. The flesh and the Spirit oppose one another. The Spirit wants this, you want that. And that's why when it comes to planning for your life, for your family, there has to be one direction. Lord, I do not want to take this decision lightly. And we think sometimes we can just buy a house and do what we want to do. No, you need to know when you're buying something, it's of God. That's it sound ridiculous, but I want to tell you, for me, every area of my life belongs to the Lord. If I'm going to be buying something, or doing something, or going somewhere, I want to know that the Lord is in it. It's incredible, when we came back from the Mauritius conference, 
and we just came to Durban for that week. It was amazing to see the fruit of what took place in that week. Because we didn't decide to go there, because our family's there. We felt in our heart it was the Lord. And because it was the Lord, we had a fruitful time with our family. But I want to tell you, brothers, if you're planning to go with your family in the flesh, believe me, there's no flesh. There's, how can I say it? The flesh gives birth to flesh. You remember the story when you were here a couple of uh, two months ago when Brenda went to visit her mom in California? It was the perfect timing of God. And I want to tell you the fruit of that visit is evident today. From being almost like depressed and locked in a prison. That's where her mother was for whatever circumstances. But just one timely visit from God and using her daughter to be that vessel and who he decided to use at that time opened a door for her and a lifeline for her. She's a different woman today. But we just plan, I'm going to go there, do this, visit this one. Let me tell you, brothers and sisters, if your life belongs to the Lord, everything you do needs to be considered in a serious way. And I think that's what I wanted to leave with you. And there's much more we'll look at. But light plans don't have the results that we would like them to have. Because they are plans, our doing, um, our, our, our planning. That means nothing. But when it's God's plan and God's doing and God's sending and God's time, I tell you what, there is peace, there is joy, but more important than all of that, there's fruit. There's fruit. I think of this young man by the name of Ed. Yeah? I remember we were in a prayer meeting. And I, something rose up in my heart. I said, you know, I feel to pray for people in the church. You remember that day, Ed? I feel to pray for, for people in the church that are very vulnerable right now. There's all sorts of offers going on. There's all sorts of plans going on. And this man in that meeting said to me, Neil, I've had a job offer. It was in New York. Very, uh, what's the word? Tempting. Yes. Very tempting. Where would the man be today? Look what's happened in his life. Look where the Lord sent him one month ago. Look what he's a part of. And yet, for one job, we can miss the plan of God. One job, one job, one offer, one little you know, carrot that dangles, that looks good, feeds your flesh. And today there's people that are that have been disturbed because they've been given offers in the flesh, whether it's in the church or outside the church. But my desire, and I will cry to the day, I will cry to the Lord, I will be in prayer, and I will suffer what I need to suffer with, but my only desire for every single one of you in this building is one desire, the plan of God. The greatest suffering that my wife and I go through is when we see the church deviating from the plan of God. That breaks me. And I know because the message that we preach is not a message of legalism. I can't come to, 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 to Austin and say, Austin, do this. If Austin comes to me and he's made a plan to marry some woman in the world who doesn't love the Lord, I said, Austin, you've made your plan. It's dangerous for me. You know what the Bible says, but what can I do? And he marries the woman. How, how, how does that hurt us? Because we know the call of God in his life is not cheap. And it's amazing how many young people and young men and even those that are vulnerable in certain areas have been destabilized by plans that come your way that are not the plans of God. And your priority in these next few months, don't think anyone is exempt. Your priority, because I want to tell you, your test can come this afternoon or next week. But remind yourself, I cannot plan lightly where my yes is yes today and it's no tomorrow. I need to know that the Spirit of the Lord is leading me. And I want to tell you there's nothing better than that.
to be in the plan of the Lord, there's nothing better than that. To be driving to church this morning, to be in His plan, to be with you, to, to be part of what God's going to do in the months and years to, to happen, to be part of what God's going to do in Haiti. Can you imagine? Little church like this. When we share with you about the vision going forward for Haiti, you realize the Lord took a little church. He didn't choose a 50,000-seater church. He didn't choose a 2,000-seater or a 5,000-seater. In fact, he chose a very small church. And in fact, that small church is so insignificant in the eyes of the world and in the, and in the church world. They look at us and think, shame, these guys, they're trying. <laughs> they're trying. They don't have a building. They don't own a building. They're renting a building. There's only 70 of them in the church or 80. Shame, it's... And yet, and yet, the Lord doesn't look at that. He looks at the heart of the church. And He knew that He could trust us with that nation of Haiti. And He chose us to open a door by the grace of God for a nation that needs the gospel of Jesus Christ. Man can fight it. Man can oppose it. The whole church world can oppose it. But I want to tell you something. You cannot fight God. And we've learned that. You cannot fight what God is doing. Better leave people. Because if it's of God, it's going to continue. If it's not of the Lord, it's just going to fall to pieces. So let the Lord work that one out. So all I can say to you, you are a privileged people. Now you might not realize that, but it's time that you do. That the Lord handpicked you for a time as this. Insignificant as people might think. Whatever people think, let them think. But God has called you to be part of a vision in the United States of America, along with many other churches that we don't even know about today, who are going to open the door for the people of God to come back to Jesus to come back to the foundation of Jesus Christ, to be built by the Lord by His hand, not by games, not by gimmicks, not by human methods, not by money, but built by the hand of God so that bride can shine in the days to come. When the Bible talks about a glorious church, I want to tell you, the church that God is building, it's not going to be glorious in the eyes of the Christian world today. In fact, can I tell you where the greatest persecution is coming from? from in the church. Be warned. The greatest persecution, it's ridiculous to say, but you will see, and if you read it biblically, I would like to share that with you in Galatians, but we haven't got time for that. It will come from within the church. Sure, it's quite shocking, isn't it? Do you think that the church has been called out of darkness into the marvelous light of the Lord and for the church to be together but I want to tell you, there's a separation coming. Don't be deceived. Don't be deceived. There's a separation coming. And we need to decide, what road do we want? The wide road that leads to destruction or the narrow road that leads to life? That narrow road is one revelation. Take your cross. And I want to tell you, you're going to finish well. Let's stand.